attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on managing staff salaries. My name is Nathan Hayes. I am the practice finance consultant with Prima I Group, which means that with our members, um, I handle consulting around practice finances, obviously, but overhead, benchmarking, uh, strategic purchasing, like buying a practice, selling a practice, partnership agreements, bonus plans and compensation plans with our members. Prima is the uh, has joined with IDOC in the past year. We are IDOC's consulting arm. IDOC is one of the largest doctor alliances in the country offering a, a very compelling blend of product discounts and rebates in addition to networking and educational events. Prima offers one-on-one -on -one consulting with our members as well. More on that a little later. Tonight, um, what, what Dr. Steve Varga and I would like to do is give you a, a taste of the type of content with which we, we consult with our members um, and, and hopefully useful information for your practices. You're evaluating your staff and keep you abreast of, of new changes to the overtime rules that affect all, um, all employers in the country. And optometry practices are no exception to that. Uh, let me introduce briefly my colleague, Dr. Steve Vargo. Uh, Steve, introduce yourself and tell our guests a little bit about your role with Prima. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I am Steve Vargo, as Nathan said. I'm the optometric practice management consultant with Prima. I focus primarily on, on staffing, operations, office efficiency. Uh, so I'll just say thank you for joining us this evening for the webinar, and I'll, I'll pass it back to Nathan. All right, very good. So this webinar will be broken into two parts. I'm going to talk about um, evaluating your staffing levels and, and leading up to uh, sharing some of the results from our annual staff salary survey where we survey our Prima members on what they're paying different roles in their office. So I'll share that data with you and talk about how we apply it to practices and how you might use something like it um, in your own practice or if you're working with us. And then Dr. Varga is going to take over and, and give an overview of the new overtime rules and, and how they apply and how you can um, manage how you pay your staff in light of those new rules. And then we'll take questions. There is a question button in your uh, GoToWebinar panel. If you have questions along the way, just type them in, and we will take some time at the end of this presentation to answer your questions. And, and again, at the end, I'll tell you a little more about Prima and IDOC and how we're set up. But just to start off with, is, is you're evaluating your staffing in your practice, there's really, there are three questions I think that need to be answered and that I'm working with our members on answering. And they are, are very simply, how many non-RD staff should you have for your practice and how much you should, should you be spending on all your non-RD staff? And then within that, the question is, how much you, should you spend per staff member on your team? So how many staff should you have? What's the overall budget for your staff in your practice? And then within that, that overall budget, how much um, ought you to be spending on, on any given team member? So one team member might be paid very well. Another team member might be more at the bottom of the pay scale. Um, so how do you evaluate individual compensation as well as the overall package? First off, is you're looking at your overall staffing for the practice. Most practices will average one non-OD staff, and I'm saying non-OD staff here, so associate ODs or employed ODs or partner or separate category, per 150,000 in revenue. The range is typically going to fall one staff for every 125,000 to 175,000 in revenue. The way we calculate basically is to take, well, exactly, is to take your, your collected revenues for a year, say 2015, and divide it by the number of full-time equivalent staff. So in for non ODD staff, usually it's, it's enough to say a full-timer is one, a part-timer is probably half a full-time equivalent. You could take the total hours per week and divide it by 40 as well to get a more exact count. Um, but once you divide your revenues, your collected gross revenues, so net of insurance charge-offs, by your headcount and staff, you'll get a number that's gonna fall probably somewhere at the outer bounds of the range, 100,000 on the low end. Um, I mean, it can be very high on the high end, but normally it's gonna fall in that 125,000 to 175,000 range. Um, th there's a range there and, and there's a reason for that. More medically oriented practices, multi-office practices, certainly if your practice has is more Medicaid, which is not that common, but for Medicaid practices, we expect that you'll carry more staff. And so your revenue per non staff might be even in the 100,000 to 125,000 per non ODD staff. Conversely, in more expensive labor markets, we will often see um, that there are fewer staff. I and mean, that makes sense, right? That, that, um, that if staff is expensive, you have to make do with less. And so it might push in the 200, 225 range on those. Um, 
But that's a good feel for how many staff you should have. And the question is, what's the overall budget for your staff? And I'll, I'll give you this, this pretty good rule of thumb for what the, the overhead and, and profitability of most practices look like. Um, before someone asks, I'll tell you that practice net here refers to all the compensation to all the doctors, partners, associates, whatever, plus corporate profits in the practice. Um, your fixed overhead, which is your occupancy costs, your marketing spend, equipment costs, general overhead, like your software fees, your lawyers and accountants and, and supplies for the office, that usually runs about 20% of collected gross revenue. And then we always like to look at cost of goods and non duty staff together, and normally they're going to fall between the combined number of your materials costs plus your non duty staff will be between 45 and 50% of revenues. And the reason we put it together is that in many practices, well, historically it would have been probably uh, you know, 30% plus or minus goes to your materials costs, when, when, you know, for the practice, it was, it was primarily most of the revenues were coming for, or at least an overweighted amount of the revenues were coming from eyeglass sales, and then 20% plus or minus to staff. As the profession has changed and become more medical, and in Medicaid practices in particular, we often see the cost of goods falling into the low 20s for a Medicaid or medical practice, and a corresponding increase in the staff investment. So it might be 20 to 22% for cost of goods, and 25 to 27% for the non RD staff. In a Medicaid practice, that drops even further. Cost of goods might be 10% of revenues and 30% plus going to staff. So we look at those together. Think of it as your cost of sales, your, your materials, and your staff are what it takes to deliver revenues from the patients, absent the doctors who are counted as part of the practice net. Um, and again, that, that tells us on the staff investment, maybe it should be 20, 18%, maybe it should be 22%, maybe it should be 24%. We always want to look at, to look at it together. And just because you're in line on, on staff, um, on the overall headcount, the third question is, what should you be, be spending per staff? Because if you're lean on staff, it, I'll tell you from our data and, and historical data, um, the, a practice will typically spend on average 32 or $16 an hour per staff member. So 32000 plus whatever payroll taxes and benefits you have, maybe 34000 on average per person. But if your per person cost is in you know, 40000 or more, um, you may be making do with less people and still hitting this number, but you're making do with less people, so that headcount question you wouldn't answer. And you just have to recognize that if labor costs are high, we need to work on 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 arresting the growth in our staff costs or just recognize that maybe you practice in a more expensive labor market and you just you have to pay more to get good people. And that's that's just the way it is. And you just work around that number. Finally, and, and you can find data sets like this, I'm sure from the AOA, uh, Esplan Team of Visions Management and Business Academy, the MBA program, put together numbers like this for a number of years. That data is a little old at this point. They haven't been surveying lately. Um, but this is how we present the data. So we'll take any given role in the practice and give, give a range from the low to the high because we have practices all over the country. So very inexpensive labor markets, say, think maybe rural areas of the southeast. Up to very expensive labor markets, you know, New York, New Jersey, California, major metropolitan areas. But for most practices, you're going to see your your costs running more in this 20th to 80th percentile. That medians here, and, and when you're looking at any given role in the practice, um, I mean, the way to use a data set like this is just to ask what is, you know, what's the average, and then maybe I am in a more expensive labor market. And ways to do that, you could just you may just know, hey, I practice in New York City, people are expensive, everything's expensive. Um, you can go to websites like salary.com or indeed.com and, and punch in and they'll give you information on what the prevailing wages in your area are for roles like this. Um, you can go to the Department of Labor and find out what, they're going, what they report. None of those are going to be exact. Neither is our data going to be exact, but they're good reference at points for what should an individual's pay be. Um, and this is something within just because we're talking about both content and what Prima does, evaluating these metrics, benchmarking your practice in this way, benchmarking your payroll scale, schedule in this way is a regular part of, of our consulting with members. What, one of the things to note on some of the more expensive roles here, particularly office managers, if you look at, at, at the median wage for an office manager, according to the 115 practices that responded to our survey this year, um, at about $21 per hour, there have been new overtime changes to the overtime laws, 
where office managers often oftentimes will be considered exempt. Um, and you know, if you have an office manager that you want to work hard, you're going to above against the new rules. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Devargo to, to pick up the torch and talk about the new rules and how it applies. And then we'll come back a little later and talk about um, a little more detail on how Primo works with our members on questions like this and take your questions on on the salary data, on paying your staff, on the new overtime rules. So Steve, take it away. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Uh, so this is the third time that me and Nathan have uh, done this webinar and I will concede that some of the details can be a, a bit confusing if you're hearing it for the first time. So having done it three times now, I think I'll, I'll start off here by anticipating a few of the common questions that have come in on the other webinars and just clarify a few things right from the beginning. I think it'll help you better understand the rest of the webinar. Um, two key points to understand um, is that one, this the new overtime rules only applies to salaried workers. So none of what I'm going to say applies to hourly workers. Nothing has changed with hourly workers. Um, it only applies to salary and, and I'll explain uh, as we um, as we move forward here, what qualifies somebody as a salary? <clears throat> and in in a nutshell, basically the gist of the overtime rule is uh, there is a salary threshold right now for overtime, and that salary threshold is twenty three thousand six hundred and sixty dollars. What that means is that if you are a salaried employee making less than twenty three thousand six sixty you would be entitled to overtime pay even if your salary if you make over twenty three thousand six sixty uh, you would be exempt from overtime the change in the overtime rule is that that threshold is going up considerably it's going up to a little over uh, forty seven thousand dollars so how that affects you is let's say you currently have an office manager uh, on salary making thirty five thousand well right now today that salary manager would be exempt from overtime. If she worked 42 hours, you, you wouldn't have to pay for the additional work. But with that threshold going up to over $47,000, uh, once this new rule kicks in, that same employee would actually be entitled to overtime pay. So I hope that helps you better understand the, uh, uh, the, the, the gist of it. And then, oops, sorry, get back here. Sorry about that, went a little bit too far ahead. So uh, the new overtime rules, it's, this is part of the Fair Labor Standards Act, and you might also hear it referred to as white collar EAP exemption. Uh, that stands for executive, administrative, or professional. So this tends to apply to the, the white collar workers. Um, and employees covered by the FLSA are entitled to time and a half if they work, uh, if, if the hours they work exceed 40 hours in a week. And it's important to note that that is calculated weekly. So you couldn't, uh, let's say, take an employee, a salaried employee, who works 38 hours one week and 42 hours the next week and average that out for two weeks even if they were paid bi-weekly. Um, you would not be able to do that. It is calculated weekly. And this new law uh, will become effective December 1st of this year. So what determines if somebody qualifies to be salary? As we mentioned before, this only applies to salaried employees, uh, but there are certain guidelines to, um, to be classified as, as someone who would be salary. Uh, their, their primary duty must be the performance of office or non-manual work that directly relates to management of the practice. And also the primary duty includes exercising discretion and independent judgment with respect uh, to matters of significance. So for the most part in an optometric practice, this is going to be your managers. Um, under this definition, it would be uh, difficult and probably inappropriate to classify a front desk person or a technician or even an optician without any kind of decision making or managerial oversight to classify that person um, as a salaried employee. So for the most part this law applies to uh, office managers in the practice. And to determine if you qualify, uh, in addition to being salary, there are, I'm, uh, I mean in addition to being um, salaried, there are uh, qualifications regarding 
the uh, the amount of money you make. And once the new threshold or the new law kicks in, you must be paid more than nine hundred thirteen dollars a week. So um, I mentioned before the new threshold from twenty three thousand six sixty. Well, that's going up to forty seven thousand four seventy six annually, to be specific. And as we mentioned, this primarily um, applies to people with executive, administrative, or professional duties. It's, as, as we said, the, a white-collar law, white-collar exemption. Uh, the new rule covers all employers, and there's no minimum number, number of employees. Uh, you might be familiar with other regulations like FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act, where you have to have at least 50 employees uh, um, for that to have a bearing on you. Um, and that's not the case with the uh, the overtime laws, and also this does not apply to doctors. So again, this will be primarily uh, a, a rule, a, a law that affects the uh, the managers in your office. Um, doctors would be exempt from this. And so, why the revision? Well. Uh, for one thing, it's somewhat outdated. The last update to this was in 2004, uh, and as we mentioned, the current threshold is about half of what it's um, moving up to. It was 23,660. Uh, and also, for some time now, workers' rights groups have argued that while companies have profited quite a bit since the overtime laws were last changed um, in 2004, that much of the growth has come at the workers' expense. And these groups have argued that the most vulnerable groups are those most likely to be exploited from the, the lower income earning groups. And also, even though it hasn't changed in a long time, like I, I had mentioned, there's not been a change since 2004, don't expect that to continue. Uh, it will go up. In fact, the Department of Labor intends to increase the salary threshold every three years. So the first update would be uh, January 1st of 2020, and the uh, projections uh, for that first update uh, are expected to rise to 51,000 at that time. And does this include bonuses? Okay. Uh, so let's say you have a office manager who's making just under um, the threshold, in which case you would have to pay that office manager um, overtime if they work beyond 40 hours. Well, let's say their base pay is, is at that level, but they also make a bonus. Could you apply that bonus to their total salary to meet or exceed the threshold so you don't have to pay them overtime if they were to work over 40 hours. Well, you can apply bonuses, but with limitations. So uh, employers will be able to use non-discretionary bonuses. I'll explain in a minute what that is, um, and incentive payments to satisfy up to 10% of the standard salary level. So yes, bonuses will, you can apply that to their, um, uh, to their total package salary that uh, would become the basis for the threshold, but only 10% of the bonuses uh, would you be able to apply to that. And also these payments have to be made on quarterly or more frequent basis. So if you pay out a bonus annually or even semi-annually, you would have to change the frequency of that to meet the guidelines to uh, quarterly or more frequent. And uh, this is something that was not allowed under the, uh, the previous rule. As far as non-discretionary bonuses, um, non-discretionary bonuses are forms of compensation uh, promised to employees to induce them to work more efficiently or to remain with the company. So um, by contrast, discretionary bonuses are at the employer's sole discretion and not in accordance with any pre-announced standards. So um, as an example, an unannounced holiday bonus would be uh, a discretionary bonus because the bonus is entirely at the discretion of the employer. Whereas, let's say a quarterly bonus for reaching a certain growth target uh, for a quarter, and, and this is a pre-announced performance target, uh, that would actually be non-discretionary. You would be able to apply that to the, um, uh, to the, to the salary level. So just to take an example of that, obviously we've, um, with the new threshold being the 47,476, uh, let's say you pay a um, uh, your your office manager forty six thousand 
and uh, you would be uh, so you would have a, a difference there of 1,476. So under this scenario, the uh, this individual would not be um, exempt from overtime because they do not reach that threshold. But wait a second. Let's say we pay them a a bonus of five thousand um, dollars annually. Again, just to to reiterate, that would have to be paid out quarterly uh, in, in in quarterly payments. But let's just say for the over the course of a year, uh, they have a five thousand dollar bonus. Remember, you can only apply ten percent of that, which would be five hundred dollars. We would still be short of meeting the threshold. So even with that bonus, uh, in this situation, you would have to pay um, this individual overtime. So options for responding to the rule, uh, one is to increase the salary of the employee to the new salary level um, so they will remain exempt. This is a um, probably a good option for somebody who's uh, possibly being paid just below the salary level and you anticipate that they will be working overtime. This may be a good time to give them a raise uh, if that makes financial sense so they would be um, exempt from having to pay overtime. Uh, you could also pay the overtime rate, which is you kind of don't have a choice with that one. Uh, you could reduce or eliminate overtime hours. This will probably be one of the more popular options is that employers would just keep a closer eye on the weekly hours that people work and either um, restrict people from working overtime or try to minimize the number of hours that they work overtime. Uh, Another option is to reduce, uh, if you wanted to hold the weekly pay constant, you could reduce the amount of base pay that you pay them, anticipating that they're going to be paid more in, in overtime. If this is somebody who all of a sudden uh, is being paid overtime that wasn't before, um, that's an option. It may not be a real popular option with the employee because now they will be working more but getting paid uh, the same. And so. Uh, of course, you could also use some combination of the uh, of the above responses. So, I, this slide is not as complicated as it looks. So I just wanted to give you an example of uh, something to consider moving forward. Is as you hire somebody who would qualify for salary. Would you want to pay them salary, or does it make more financial sense just to move them hourly, taking into consideration the th new threshold? What I wouldn't recommend doing is taking a, let's say, an, a manager, an office manager, who um, and who is paid our salary and moving them toward hourly if it's going to mean a decrease in their pay. It's an option, but again, it might not be a real popular option with them. However, let's say after the new threshold kicks in, you are in the market for a new manager. Should we pay them salary or hourly? Well, uh, let's look at two different scenarios. Um, one, an employee who makes 30000 a year and remains a salaried employee. Uh, so again, once the new threshold kicks in, uh, currently this person would not be eligible for overtime, but they will be uh, after December 1st. So in this situation, uh, because their salary, um, if you look at week one, they work 35 hours, they're on salary. Week two, 38 hours, it's the same pay, we're on salary. Uh, but week three, we work 43 hours. Now we have to pay more because there's three additional hours of work there. So uh, that's going to make that week uh, require a higher payout. And then, uh, of course, week four. So we've got a gross pay there of 23.72. And if we compare that with uh, same scenario, but the employee, instead of being paid salary, is paid hourly, then we have a situation where the total pay for the same amount of hours would come out to 2271. So uh, if you recall from the previous slide, that is about $100 less a month that you would be paying this individual by paying them hourly, so about $1,200 a year. So again, just something to consider as you move forward and consider hiring new people who would be eligible at, at salary. And then I'm going to kick this back to Nathan here. I, I just want to mention one thing, uh, closing statement here regarding the overtime pay is 
you may not have had to track hours before if it's somebody who was salary and was not eligible for overtime. There may not have been a reason to, but the new law does require that you track salary now for people who are um, are eligible for overtime. There are no requirements that you have any kind of formal uh, system to do that. They don't necessarily need to punch in and out. It doesn't have to be any formal system, but you do have to keep track of it uh, some way, even if that's just a spreadsheet or even if it's just the employees writing down the time that they started and the time they ended, somebody has to now track those hours so you can keep uh, keep track of them and make sure that you're compliant with the new uh, laws. And uh, I hope that clears things up. I'm happy to answer questions. And I, I think at this point I'll um, kick this back over to Nathan and, and let him mention a few things about Prima. Thank you so much, Steve. A um, couple of things about Prima I Group and how we're set up. We are a retainer-based consultancy, which means that our members have access to our entire team of consultants. To me, Dr. Vargo, um, we have consultants specialized in HR, optical sales, um, you know, po policies. Dr. Vargo has a special interest in, in leadership. As, as much as you want for your dues, dues are $3.95 per month. That's a flat fee. There are no upcharges for other things. Um, in addition to our team, we offer services like the staff salary survey that you just saw. We do an annual benchmarking survey on practice finance benchmarks, so you can see not only where your practice is, but compare yourself to other practices within Prima. We um, have a wonderful, in terms of staff, uh, testing service for evaluating new potential hires. Um, and, uh, and we also have conferences in conjunction now with IDOC. We have two national conferences, more on that in a minute, as well as a couple of regional conferences every year where not only we get great content from speakers within optometry and outside of optometry, which is often so valuable, as, as well as chances to network with your peers. Prima, Prima members get paired in groups of eight to 10 optometrists for a day spent just discussing the issues of your practice. Uh, you'll be paired off based on the size of your practice, roughly your age, so that you're the same stage of your ownership experience. And you can just pass to the issues. You bring your own challenges, your own success pearls to the group, and, and we give you five hours of, of time just to, to get the best ideas of your peers. We're very smart at Prima. We know a lot about private practice. But every time that we get to sit in these groups, we learn something, too. So it's not as though we have all the answers. We believe that that the group, the network as a whole of Prima doctors, of IDOC doctors, independent optometrists, competing and, and succeeding um, have great ideas that are worth sharing. Um, premium membership dues do include membership in IDOC, so you'll have access to their um, fantastic program of discounts and rebates with top vendors from across the industry. I've been in the buying group side of the business for five years before Prima started. IDOC has a program that, in my view, is second to none. And, and so, uh, you know, in many cases, you'll be able to offset your Prima dues just with the discounts and rebates you're receiving over and beyond what you're going to negotiate directly in most cases. Um, so great program there. And again, IDOC also offers quarterly study group dinners in, in many markets, not all markets. But uh, I just attended one in Atlanta. Great discussion among doctors um, on dealing with uh, emerging technologies and new competition like Warby Warby Parker, for instance, or you know, the more, um, the new threats of kiosk optometry, for instance. So encourage you to, to know more about that. If you want to know more about IDOC and Prima, um, you can email questions to info at IDOC.net or call 203-853-3333 and learn more about um, Prima and IDOC. We are also making available to everyone here tonight, if you want to set up 30 minutes with Dr. Vargo or me to talk about what we talked about tonight or any issue for your practice, um, you can call and, and talk to the IDOC team and they will send you a link to get on our calendars and we would love to talk to you about your practice and how we can help you succeed on your own terms in private practice optometry. And, and finally, if you have questions, start typing them by all means or we'll just call it a night. Um, we have a couple of conferences coming up. We'd encourage you to come join us. If you, if you like what you've heard tonight, you want to hear more. Um, September 25th, which is the Sunday in Philadelphia, We'll be there for a full day of content. I'll be speaking there. Uh, Dr. Varga and I both will be speaking at our conference in October um, in Scottsdale, Arizona, which will be great. Um, and then we'll be in San Diego on December 4th. Um, another opportunity to hear from, from the Prima team, talk to us one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, 
get networked with the, the doctors within Prima and IDOC and, and learn more about the, the, the view of how we're helping, again, independent optometrists succeed in private practice. So, um, again, if you have questions, please please type them in on, on any of the content tonight or anything at all. We're, we're happy to, to help you. Um, we, um, yes, I can make these slides available to you. Um, if you actually, I take that back. Um, the, the salary survey data is an exclusive uh, benefit to Prima members. Um, if you want the, the rest of the slides, I'm happy to send them. Um, but we do try to keep that proprietary. I wanted to show it to tonight just to give you a taste of what Prima is about. Um, so it's hard for, for, for committing early. Um, but if you, if you want to see, um, see those slides, if you would, um, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm going to put, cut, cut out the, uh, survey data, but, um, you can shoot me an email at nhaze at premygroup.com and I will, I will forward those on to you. Um, and with that, we'll go to some other questions. So one question is, can you pay staff salary and have them clock in and out and pay overtime for anything over 40? Um, for those who are not exempt. So, so when we talk about exempt, I'm going to take this one, Steve. So when we talk about exempt and non-exempt, exempt means salaried and exempt traditionally is meant that you don't have to pay overtime. If you're paying someone, if they're clocking in and out and you're paying, um, and they're not exempt from overtime, you have to pay overtime. So your, your hourly employees, um, uh, they, they have to be paid overtime. And, and again, anyone who's even exempt, anyone you have on salary who's making less than 47 or whatever the number was, um, also, if they work more than 40 hours in a week, you have to pay them overtime for that time. Um, another question. Uh, do you have any information on associate doctor average salary uh, for a new grad versus an experienced doctor? Uh, Yes, if you look at AOA data and our own internal uh, data on that, um, in private practice, according to AOA, the self-reported number for a doctor right out of school is 89000 a year. Um, there's some range around that. It's lower, say, in California, where the, the market seems to be flooded. Uh, it might be higher if you're in a rural practice where you need to pay more to get someone to come out to you because you're in a less desirable place to live and work. Um, in private practice optometry, there's some, some squishiness here, but, uh, range probably goes up to about 130, 135,000 a year. Um, in corporate ophthalmology, that might be as high as 150. That's the typical range. It's not to say that I haven't seen associates getting paid 100,000, 80,000 or more. Uh, but I wouldn't really recommend that except in very special cases, if ever. Hey, then I'll. Take the next one here. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the question has to do with an associate OD, whether to pay them as a contractor or an employee. Our advice is usually, and it's aligned with the what the IRS likes to see, uh, is to pay uh, your associate ODs as employees. Um, the reason for that is a contractor, uh, if you're referring to a 1099 contractor, that usually doesn't meet the definition of, of an associate. Uh, as far as the IRS is considered, um, if you are... Uh, if you're supplying the, the facility and setting the hours and, and setting the pay and providing the equipment, that person is an employee in the eyes of the IRS. IRS they could actually come in if, if there was some kind of an audit and if you had them, uh, if you're paying them as a 1099 independent contractor is make the determination that that is not indeed the case and you could have to pay fines and back taxes and we've seen that happen so um, our advice is usually to pay them as an employee um, if they're going to be working with whether it's full-time or part-time there might be some flexibility there if it's just a fill-in doctor and there probably is but as far as somebody who's going to be working with you on a regular basis even if it's part-time uh, it's typically best to pay them as an employee yeah, if you want to, if you want to, um, 1099, your, your associate doctor is working for you regularly, please talk to your CPA before doing so. I mean, the best advice that we have is it's just, it's not allowed by the rules. Um, but, but get, get your CPA's blessing before going that route. Good. The next question, what about employees that are salaried but are not managers? Um, I would need to know more about the position, but again, you'd have to be real careful to decide if that is somebody who would meet the qualifications 
for someone who could be salaried. I don't know of many other positions, and you'd want to take a close look at that, uh, where somebody who's not in a managerial role would qualify for um, as someone who could meet uh, or, or would be making salary. So if you did have somebody salary, you had a salary position, uh, but they were not a manager. I, I'm not exactly sure what role that would be in an optometric practice, but uh, they anybody who's salaried these rules would apply to if they met the the, um, uh, the, the salary requirements. Uh, the follow-on to that was an assistant to an OD. I, I, I again review the, the qualifications for exemption depending on how much they're doing for the doctor. Um, and, you know, they they may or may not qualify to be salaried anyway. You may need to um, switch them to to an hourly position. Yeah, doc, if I understand the question on this one, um, we have an associate doc working two days every two weeks. He's not being paid over forty-seven k. Um, but he's exempt from overtime. How do we get around the minimum pay rule? Well, the, if I understand this right, the doctors are exempt from this, so it wouldn't apply to them. If I'm if I'm understanding that, your question. and that minimum pay is for a full a, a full timer. I mean, your two day a week associate should never push past forty hours a week. Oh, uh, it's in a okay. yeah. Um, you know, again, it's only for if they work more than forty hours a week. So they're part time. It's really not an issue, and oftentimes we see doctors being paid hourly on a per diem anyway, just just as as a note. It's sometimes a cleaner way to do it for a very part time, particularly if someone working two days every couple of weeks. Um, I I would just say pay them hourly or pay them a per diem for when they're in the office. And is it a, a follow up to the question about what about employees that are salaried but not managers? Uh, there was some clarification that the employee is, is an assistant to the OD. Um, I doubt that they would meet the uh, criteria to be paid salary. So you may want to reconsider how you're paying them. Again, most people that are paid salary under the guidelines would be people that have uh, usually some kind of managerial oversight. They supervise other people. They have decision-making power in the business. And, and usually this falls back to people with uh, who have manager titles. Not always, but an assistant to an OD, it would be a difficult. That would be a stretch probably to, um, you can put them on salary, but would there be, uh, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that they'd be someone who would, uh, you wouldn't run into problems with that if, if that classification were called into question. Uh, what about a marketer for the practice at a salary? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it, it's hard to go off just a title. And in fact, you can't go off just a title. So uh, the question is, what about a marketer for the practice? Um, again, what I would encourage you to do is look up uh, through the, um, you can look it up through the IRS, and there's there's other sites out there, Department of Labor, and you'll get the uh, a, a more thorough definition of what qualifies as uh, somebody who could be paid paid on salary. Um, here's a good question. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. Oh, well, can can comp time be used in lieu of overtime pay? The answer is very deliberately no. Um, but having said that, if you know someone's going to have to work late one night, or you're going to you're going to bring um, an hourly employee to a conference, what you can do is in that week give them time off another time of the week to keep their hours for the week under forty. So you, so you cannot use comp time later in lieu of overtime, but you can adjust someone's hours in the given week to keep them under forty hours. So you have to be very thoughtful if if you're expecting someone to work late one night, for instance. I don't know if you're putting on a um, an open house or, or, or something like that. Um, you could just give them a morning off to offset the extra hours in the evening. They have to stay under 40 hours for the week. Or you can pay them overtime. Other questions?
All right. Well, as I, as I try to wrap us up, usually another question will trickle in. Um, if they don't, though, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate the chance to share a little bit of, of um, our ideas for helping manage your staff salaries and keep you abreast of the new rules. Um, sincerely hope that you will give consideration to joining Prima I, I Group and IDOC as a way both to manage your cost of goods, have a chance to network with other Ds in, in, in the, the profession in our country and benefit from our experience consulting with well over, um, I mean, I, I've done P&L analyses on over 500 practices at this point. We've probably had 700 practices in Prima over the life of our company that we've gotten a chance to work with, look at their numbers, both members, even prospects in that number. Um, so we've seen a lot of different practices, have a lot of ideas on what can work for your practice and your unique situations. And, and if you think about joining us, the thing I, I tell you about us as a, as a group is um, we're very interested in, in figuring out what your goals are as an owner and tailoring solutions for your unique situation. We do not have a, a fixed model for how you ought to practice. Um, we want to know how, what you want your practice to look like, and we'll give you the best advice we can on how to, how to be successful on your own terms in that format. So, again, thank you so much. Um, just to scroll back real quick. Um, you know, if you if you want to um, set up a time to talk more with us one on one about your specific situation, uh, you can email info at idoc.net or you can call 203-853-3333. And again, if you consider, you can go to idoc.net and and see the conference registration links for the upcoming events as well. We'd love to see you there. Love to talk to you. Love to work with your practices and help you succeed. With that, I will sign off. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we will hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Good night.